Good evening, you're listening to WHEI 88.9, broadcasting live from Heidelberg University in Tiffin, Ohio. You are tuned in to the Nasty Fries. This is Dominic Fry. I'm here with Sean Humphreys, Kyle Nash, Cam Weeks. That's the squad. Nasty Fries, man. Best of the best out here. Um, so we opened up with, you know, just kind of opening segment, talking about our summers, quick little recap and such, uh, just so the fans, uh, you know, I mean, from the emails and texts I have been receiving from fans, they say they like that part of it. They like to, you know, get to know us on a personal level as well. So now we're going to open it up, or excuse me, we open it up with that. Now we are going to talk about the NBA. The meat and potatoes. The meat and potatoes, man. We're going to talk okay. about this uh, NBA off season okay. that we have. Yeah. Um, yeah, a crazy off season happened. So this yeah, year. we're kind of all gonna take like one. Uh, I mean, yeah, cr- wild off season for sure. We're all gonna take like one transaction, one uh, trade that's gone down, some one acquisition from this summer, and you know, kind of go more in depth about it. Um, you know, one person will bring it up, and we'll bounce around the idea and discuss it as a group, then like we always do. Um, so you want to open us up, Kyle, and talk about one of the trades from this summer? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, open up with. Uh, Everyone thinks the Cavs trade. I'm going to talk about no. I'm going to talk about Jimmy Butler um, getting traded to um, mini, the Minnesota Timberwolves, and uh, he got traded for Zach Levine and Chris Dunn and a number seven pick. Um, so this is a really big trade uh, for the Timberwolves. Um, they're now picking up a really good roster after this, um, and you know I don't really know uh, how Jimmy Butler feels about this. I know it happened a while ago. Is on. Uh, you know, it was in June the 22nd, but we haven't been here all summer, so uh, I'm interested to see what you guys think about it. I think it's going to be a good move for the for the Wolves, but let's see what you guys got to hear about it. About the uh, Jimmy Butler trade. Um, so I think it was a good move. Um, obviously, I think Zach Levine's going to turn into a pretty good player uh, if he stays healthy, and I think Chris Dunn is going to as well. So, um, so obviously the Timberwolves kind of gave up some of that uh, some younger potential talent. Some yeah potential. some of the future potential um for the organization um and they're kind of starting to move into this win now kind of strategy or win within the next couple of years kind of strategy right um with what they're doing um now i think they have a really good core in place with butler wiggins and carl anthony towns um and they picked up you know a decent point guard and uh, a solid power forward and i think their bench is still a little shaky. Um, I think that's something that they're going to have to kind of figure out and make maybe a move or two to kind of fix. But um, I think within the next couple of years, I think they could be uh, one of the top seeds in the West if they keep this up. And uh, it's exciting to see what they could do under Tom Thibodeau and uh, his scheme. So I think I think they're going to be a pretty exciting team to watch this year. Yeah, and on the on the other end, now you're looking at the Bulls team. Um, they seem to be doing the opposite. They seem to be, you know, kind of getting rid of those the big gun and uh, looking at the future for them, maybe long term, not trying to win now anymore. I know when they, they I mean, talks of them buying out Dwayne Wade and him possibly leaving then too. Yeah. I mean, that's their two big pieces from last year was Wade and Butler both leaving. Rondo. So uh, Rondo, but did play well in the playoffs for him. So I mean, yeah, the Bulls definitely turning over a new leaf. Yeah. For sure. So, uh, Dominic, uh, I know you got a trade you're pretty passionate about. If you want to open up with that one. Um, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, as everybody knows, diehard Cavs fan. Um, still a little salty about this finals from last year, but, I mean, it's whatever. I'll get over it eventually. Um, so, man, crazy trade with the Celtics and the Cavaliers. I almost did not go through. <laughs> Almost was declined because of Isaiah Thomas's hip injury, um, and I understand. I am biased, you know. I'm a Cleveland Cavaliers fan, but I truly think the Cavs completely like. I think the Cavs won this trade clearly. Um, I mean, Isaiah, like, okay, don't get me wrong. Obviously, Kyrie Irving, Kyrie Irving, and I said in the booth last spring, um, and I literally said during the finals and all these times, like I think Kyrie Irving was one of the most underrated, still is, one of the most underrated players in the NBA. Because he's playing alongside LeBron James, people don't recognize his greatness. I truly believe he is, a, if not top five, definitely a top ten all-around player in this league and not just point guard, all-around player. He's phenomenal, but when you're playing with one of the best guys in the entire world, like people aren't going to recognize that as quickly. 
That being said, Isaiah Thomas is no scrub. Isaiah Thomas, you look at the team that that Celtics had, and yeah, they got swept by the Cavs in the Eastern Conference Finals, but he had a phenomenal season, played fantastic. He's essentially a poor man's Kyrie Irving. Like, they're very similar. They're very good at offense. They're very average at defense. Um, I don't think he's as good as Kyrie, obviously. But I think he's, like, a step down from Kyrie. I think he's almost the same player. And, again, you think look at everything that Isaiah did when he had to do it on his own. Even, I don't know if you guys read his letter that he had today that he released from the Players' Tribune. He mentions that. He says, you know, like, I was getting double, triple teamed in Boston. You really think they're going to double, triple team me in Cleveland with Kevin Love, with LeBron James? No way. He's going to get so, he's going to be so free and so open, it's going to be insane. And then on top of Isaiah Thomas, we had Jay Crowder, a phenomenal defender. And then on top of that, we get the new, or excuse me, wow. The Brooklyn Nets first round pick, which is definitely a top five, if not a top three, if not a number one pick in the NBA draft, which is either A, securing our future with a number one, with a high pick like that, or B, just gives us more leverage to go out and get uh, DeMarcus Cousins or somebody else in a trade. Um, So as a, and especially like as a Cavs fan, I mean, Kyrie Irving, I mean, I love the guy, but I don't know, just kind of, in my opinion, didn't really handle it the best. Um, so, I mean, I was kind of happy to see him go in a way because I just was getting kind of a sour taste in my mouth with him. But I, I, I love this trade. And especially with all the rumors I was hearing that Andrew Wiggins, um, Devin Booker, all these guys and all these teams kept declining, kept declining, de- kept declining. And I'm like, great. I'm like, we're going to end up keeping Kyrie, and that's going to be the most awkward thing in the world when he has to go back to training camp and LeBron James is still there. Um, so I was glad to be able to get him out of the locker room and I thought the guys that we got from it was a huge, huge trade. I, I was happy with it. I really was. So, obviously, we're not going to know whether the trade was worth it or not until um, the conference finals this year. Because, let's be honest, it'll probably be Celtics and uh, Cavs. Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah, who's going to be the three seed? Like, the East is so bad at this point. Probably the 76ers will be a three. <laughs> yeah. So, I guess we'll find out then. But I, I honestly would probably disagree with you. Um, about the trade and who won it. I would say that uh, Boston sure did, and I, I don't know specifically why, but I think that um, Kyrie's going to bring uh, a fire to their team that I don't think Isaiah Thomas was able to bring. Um, and I guess I won't be able to, to say anything about it until the Eastern Conference Finals, which they'll probably still lose because LeBron James is still the king of the East. I mean, it'll be interesting to see, you know, how Kyrie and Gordon Hayward work together. You yeah. Know? Like Gordon Hayward, I mean, those are two new guys, too. I mean, the, the Celtics were the number one team in the East. They did not go to the finals, but they were the number one team record-wise in the East. And they got rid of, like, their whole starting lineup. Obviously, Kyrie and Gordon Hayward, phenomenal players. So it'll be interesting to see, like, that whole new dynamic for Boston, how that works for them. Sorry. I no, I, I definitely agree with you guys. Um I definitely think when it comes to who won the trade, I think the Celtics won the trade as for this year, and for long term, I think the Cavs won it long term. Because I know as as the rumors keep going around whether or not LeBron James is going to stay in Cleveland, that brings up a whole new situation where you just got a huge deal and a huge chunk of money with Isaiah Thomas and that leads to whether or not he could potentially stay there. And with that number one pick that they're getting from the Nets and bringing an asset who is a number one overall pick who can help your team, you know, it, maybe even a fraction of what LeBron James could do, it's just going to be, you know, hard to tell. But I, like Kyle was saying, I definitely think that Kyrie Irving adding to the, the Celtics who went to the Eastern Conference Finals last year, which is a huge step, adding Gordon Hayward, having a big man like Al Horford, who is a solid player um, offensively and defensively. I know that they lost a lot of pieces to that. I know, you know, not having Jay Crowder and... um, I mean, obviously they replaced their guys. It's just the fact of just new guys and, like, new chemistry and how that worked for them, you know? The one player I wish that they could have kept was Avery Bradley. I feel like he's on the up and up for sure, and that would have been a good asset to keep in Boston. I think he would have played really did they, well. Did they trade him or did he sign away? I, Didn't they trade him to the I think they traded Pistons? him. 
was gonna say I believe that they did trade him. Yeah, oh, I was I was shocked by that one. But. Yeah. So um, I mean, I liked the trade. I thought it was interesting. I don't think anybody's gonna know really who won or lost this trade until we know how healthy Isaiah Thomas is gonna be and if he comes back and he's the same player, if he's better, if he's a little bit worse, if he kind of is a little rusty. Or, I mean, if he just leaves at the end of this year, uh, the organization, I mean, it, that could always happen as well. I mean, obviously, if he comes back and he's rusty this year or he's just not himself, he doesn't get normal minutes, um, or if he just doesn't gel, then maybe the Celtics won if Kyrie, you know, keep, keeps doing what he does. Um, but, you know, that's kind of hard to tell. Um, but, I mean, considering if – saying he's healthy and, you know, everything goes well that. I mean, I think the Cavaliers won this trade. Um, I think mainly because of that draft pick. Um, I think the whole Isaiah Thomas and Jay Crowder was um, obviously good to bring onto the roster if you're going to lose a guy like Kyrie. But I think that pick gives them, obviously, like Dom was talking about, leverage to go out and get somebody else. I think that's going to be huge. I think that's going to be a big pickup because obviously if it was a pick from, you know, the Warriors, it wouldn't really mean that much. You're getting the 30th best guy coming out of college basketball. But now you're getting a top five guy more than likely, um, given that the Nets are probably going to be a bottom team in the East again this year, um, barring a miracle. So um, I think that that was really interesting that they got that pick. Obviously the second round probably pick isn't going to do much. Um, they're probably just going to throw that in with a deal to close it. But, yeah, I think that pick was definitely interesting. I think they're – I mean, we'll see what they do with it. I think they're going to end up shopping it and, you know, selling it out and put it in a trade for, you know, Amon Shumpert. And maybe you can get a Boogie Cousins. Maybe you can get somebody. Um, and if if that goes through, I mean, hopefully the Cavs kind of figure it out and get something going before uh, the playoffs come so they're kind of comfortable with their rotations and things like that. But I am kind of excited to see Kyrie in Boston. I think that's going to be very interesting. Um, I like Brad Stevens as a coach. I think he does an incredible job in Boston uh, with what he's had to work with. Um, now he has a little bit of star power, but he lost a lot of defense this offseason, so... Um, I think it's going to be kind of a, a weird start to the season uh, for their team. But um, I think they have a lot of upside with um, the guys they brought in this offseason, their draft pick, Jason Tatum, and the two guys they got in uh, trades and free agency as well. So I think it was a good trade. I think it benefited both sides, and uh, I think it's going to be exciting for the NBA, a good storyline at least. Hey, don't worry, though. If Isaiah Thomas don't work out, the Cavs always got – D Rose on the bench. Very let, true. Let's be honest. The best acquisition this summer was Rajon Rondo, the New Orleans Pelicans. Oh, so let's just be honest oh, about geez. that. Uh, obviously, it was Victor Oladipo to the Pacers. That would <laughs> yeah. that'd be the biggest trade that happened this whole summer. So, Don't worry. We'll no, get I mean, to I'm, that. We'll get to that. I was going to say, on a serious note, though, switching over kind of to Rondo, though, I mean... Rondo is such a phenomenal player, obviously, with the Celtics. And, like, he's so, like, good slash, like, bad um, because he seems like such, like, a bad chemistry and, like, a locker room guy. But, obviously, he's a phenomenal player. If, you know, he fits in with his role, I think he could very well pan out with with AD, with Boogie. Like, I mean, I think he – I mean, again, obviously, at the end of the day, the Pelicans aren't going to beat the Warriors. They aren't going to be, you know, maybe be able to make the playoffs. But – I think that could really help out the Pelicans and their team that they have, picking up Rondo. I mean, you got to have a little bit of ignition for that fire and ice. I mean, sure. and he plays that role perfectly. I mean, if, if you just look back at what he did for Boston with Paul Pierce and KG, I mean, it was phenomenal. So Yeah, if they could just get, like, another guard or wingman in there, um, yeah, that would be, I mean, really shake things up for the Pelicans and, I don't know, just interesting how much how good the West is. And the West just keeps getting more and more people and their teams are so phenomenal individuals. Um I guess I, I real quick going back to like to the Celtics Cavs straight. I do think it's funny, as much as I hate the Warriors, but you know the Warriors the way they dominated the NBA, sixteen and one in the playoffs. Um like it's just crazy how like the Warriors have the NBA so shook, you know? Like you just had the two best teams, clearly, clearly the two best teams in the East, just have a major blockbuster trade 
because staying the way they are is not going to beat the Warriors. You know, and you, I mean, obviously you have, we haven't really touched on it yet. We will probably go to a song break shortly and come back to it. You know, we haven't talked touched on the Clippers and Rockets and that huge trade and the Jimmy Butler, the T-Wolves. And like, it's just crazy the dynamic of how good and not even good, but how much better the Warriors are than everybody else in the league and how crazy that has the NBA going. You know, it, um, it it's just phenomenal. It's just phenomenal to see, again, as much as I hate the Warriors, but it's just phenomenal and fun to a way just to see the way people are bouncing pieces around. And, I mean, again, like I mentioned with the Celtics, the Celtics literally were the number one team in the East, and they only are returning one of their starters from last year. Like, they're unloading their entire roster trying to switch things up to make new moves to ultimately, I guess, in a way, beat the Cavs. But then at the next step, even if they beat the Cavs, congratulations, you still got to play the Warriors in the NBA Finals. Um, I mean, all these teams are just making crazy moves, trying to bring superstars to their teams, except the Spurs. Spurs are staying pretty quiet. But, you know, everybody's making major moves this summer. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, I mean, you talked about it right before we even started talking about trades. This might be the most moves that uh, we've seen in the NBA in the off offseason. Um, it's been pretty cool to watch, and I, I think we'll di- – uh, dig uh, deeper into it after our song break um which is coming up about right now what song are we going to listen to dj fry yo uh from request from the fans um we are going to play le uzi vert you was right and we'll be right back after this one good evening you're listening to whei 88.9 broadcasting live from heidelberg university in the tiffin ohio we are the Nasty Fry Show, back at it again for an amazing season. Back at it with the white vines. Woo, 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 woo. Yeah, so uh, we're going to get back into things, um, talk about a couple different um, transactions that went on this summer with the NBA. Um, one that we're kind of going to dig into a little bit now is the Paul George uh, trade, sending him to Oklahoma City for Victor Olib- Oladipo and some other little parts. So um, I guess first thing that comes to mind when I think about this is uh, Oklahoma City wanting to kind of get back on top as much as they can and kind of move up a little bit in the West, um, kind of get back to where they were before Kevin Durant left. Um, obviously, I don't think Paul George is Kevin Durant. Um, I think he's kind of a watered-down version of him almost. But um, I think it was a good pickup. I think it was something they almost had to do. I mean, they didn't have Oladipo um, really that much, um, obviously, so it's kind of hard to see him move on so quick and keep bouncing around the NBA. But um, I think it was good for the Thunder, good for Westbrook, obviously, somebody that he can share the ball with and take a little pressure off of him on the offensive side. Uh, Paul George said, decent defender um and now they have a decent core you know with those two steven adams and uh cancer and um some of the guys coming off the bench that are kind of young but um i think you know it was kind of an interesting move i liked it um i think paul george is i don't think he's going to have a long career there i think personally he's going to move on within the next year or two and go somewhere else but I mean, if the Thunder kind of want to make a, a win-now move or something like that, maybe this is it, and maybe they can convince him to stay if they do something special this year. Uh, so we'll see. What do you think, Al? Uh Yeah, I definitely, definitely think this puts the Thunder in the right position to possibly beat the Warriors, um, which also I have a question for Sean a little bit later um, after we talk about this trade. But I also, you know, I'd like to see Victor Oladipo come back home to Indiana. You know, he played there in college. You know, he's my favorite player in the NBA strictly because he's from Indiana. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just like to see him go back home. But I definitely think it's a good trade, and it's going to make uh, the West even more competitive. I'm with Cam. I don't think um, Paul George is going to stick around too long. Um, I'm saying maybe two, three years. Um, but it'll be interesting. You got anything on this one, Dom? Oh, man, my opinion on this. One... I think a huge deal for the Thunder. Like, I understand, like, in a way, yeah, you only have him secured for one year. But they gave up Victor Oladipo and 
Domatus Sobonus. Um, Sabonis? No, no, yeah. So, essentially, they never really gave up. I mean, if you're the Pacers, I'm not quite, I don't know. Seems like a real bonehead move from the Pacers, especially, like, considering the guy you're giving up in Paul George, I feel like they could have gotten so much better than those two players. At least get some draft picks or something. Um, but, I, I mean, yeah, huge move for the Thunder. I think, for me, honestly, the most intriguing thing from this whole deal is I love... The fact that the Thunder aren't just rolling over and playing dead. You know, again, like we just talked about going to the air. All these teams m- trying to make some kind of move to compete. And like the Thunder were at the, I mean, they were a six seed. Had literally, I mean, no disrespect to the other players on the team. But pretty much nobody on the team besides Russell Westbrook. So they were at the state that either A, you got to do something crazy and make some kind of a move. Or B, you got to trade Russell and just start from scratch. You know, kind of like the Bulls we were talking about with getting rid of Jimmy Butler and potentially D Wade. Like, they had to do something because if they try to come back this next year with the same team they have, they're going to get the exact same results. They could probably make, still make the playoffs based on Westbrook's ability, but there's only, you know, there's only a limited time that Westbrook's going to be able to play at that type of level, though, too. You know, I mean, he is a human being. He has had injury problems in the past. I'm surprised he was able to play like that all this last season without any major injuries. Um, but I think, yeah, very interesting move. I think it'll be, again, I mean, obviously for the Thunder's sake, it would be very disappointing to see Paul George come here and just leave after a year. But potentially, you know, if those two guys get along and if they would work out well and if he decides to stay longer, um, I mean, that could be huge. Or even for the Thunder, if it's not panning out, if it's not going well, they can always just get rid of him at the trade deadline. It's not like... They have to hold on to him all year and then just watch him walk either. Push comes to shove. They could trade him at the t- trade deadline, and there are definitely teams in the NBA, you know, potentially the Rockets, potentially um, uh, I would say the Cavs. I'm not quite sure how that works unless Kevin Love. But, yeah, but I'm saying there are, t- yeah, well, maybe the Lakers, I guess. I mean, obviously if he was con- going to commit long-term, he could go anywhere. But I'm saying even just for the second half of the year, there are teams in potential to compete with the Warriors, to compete with the Cavs and Celtics, whoever, that I'm sure would be willing to bite on that. I'm sure they would have people um, interested in Paul George if they want to get rid of him at the trade deadline. So I think a great move. Again, at the end of the day, I just think a very bold and courageous move from the Thunder, and that's what I love about it. I love them, again, not just rolling over dead, but really taking the next step and saying, you know what, like, we're going to do something. We're going to make some kind of a splash. So to, to roll on with the, the Western acquisitions and to continue on this path to trying to defeat the Warriors, the Houston Rockets kind of thought it was their turn to acquire a big piece, and they went out there and got one of the top five point guards in the whole league, Chris Paul, or better known as Cliff Paul by the State <laughs> Forum commercials. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, the Houston Rockets got Chris Paul from the L.A. Clippers for Patrick Beverly, Lou Will, Sam Decker, DeAndre Liggins, a protected first-round pick for next year, and a few other pieces. And you know what? I think that this is a pretty bold move for the Rockets. I mean, they were a three-seed last year. You know, they played hard. James Harden was the second pick for the MVP. And, I mean, I don't know how else that you could think that this is a bad move. I mean, Chris Paul has been a phenomenal point guard. He is a dish-first kind of guy and can still score the ball. I mean, he had Blake Griffin and DeAndre Jordan to pass to, and now he has the option to dish it to James Harden, who's one of the best scorers in the entire league, surrounded with Trevor Ariza and their, you know, not-so-bad big man in Capella. I think that this is going to notch them up to a two-seed in the West. I think it might knock the Spurs down a little bit just because they're lacking in gaining assets on this offseason. But I definitely think that, that this was a good acquisition yeah, for them. I definitely think that this makes them better. I, yeah, I definitely agree that this makes them better. I think that Lou Will and Patrick Beverly were good point guards, but I just don't think that they were on the level of Chris Paul. I mean, the guy averages 20 points, 10 assists, and a three to four steals in his in his nine-year career. 
and I think that that's exactly what James Harden needs. I know that last year James Harden switched to the point guard position and pretty much had to do everything else, kind of like a Brody mentality, but now I think he gets to lay back and do what he's meant to do and you know get the ball and score the ball. Yeah, I think this is interesting. Um, obviously, they lost a lot of you know decent pieces that they had on that team. Uh, pa- Patrick Beverly, I mean, he was just more of a defensive point guard, but he was a really good defender um, on that team. So that was a little bit of loss on that side of the ball. Um, Lou Will, obviously, he actually came onto that team around the trade deadline last year and actually had a, a really good impact on the team when he got there. Um, the Rockets still have a really solid team. Um, I like the trade. I think the Clippers, I didn't. I don't think they saw it as, oh, hey, we're giving up our superstar and um, this is going to be awful for us. I think they saw it more as, you know, we're moving on. Um, I think they're kind of selling shop a little bit. Um, I think they kind of see it as, you know, we're going to get as much as we can for Chris Paul because he's getting older and we think he's going to leave. Um, I think DeAndre Jordan's going to be on his way out the door with how everything went on with the last failed trade and how everything shook out. Um, I think the only thing the Clippers really have that's set in stone right now is Blake Griffin with his huge contract. Um, But even him, he can't stay healthy. So I think the Clippers are just kind of slowly looking toward the future uh, without making it too obvious. Um, But yeah, obviously the Rockets, it's a win-now move. Um, They're a top team in the West already. Um, They had an MVP contender last year. They had the sixth man of the year. Um, and they've made a lot of pretty interesting moves the last uh, two years or so. Um, and now, yeah, like you said, they can take a little bit of pressure off James Harden, which is good. He set an NBA record last year for most turnovers in a season. He didn't just beat it. He obliterated the record, like, really bad. So I think it's going to help to take the ball out of his hands a little bit because Chris Ball is a ball-dominant point guard himself. Um so I think it'll be a good move. They can kind of split up minutes a little bit, share the ball, and uh, it'll be interesting to see kind of how they mesh together. What do you think, Kyle? You know, I don't really have much to say um, about this trade. I do. Uh, I don't know that much about it. But I had a question for Sean when we were talking about the Warriors. So we've been talking about these teams, you know, trying to win now or kind of taking a step back thinking they can't win you know, right now rebuilding, such as the Bulls. How much longer do you think that the Warriors, you know, give me a time frame, two to five years, one to five, you know, whatever. How much longer do you think the Warriors are going to continue to be that dominant in the West? Um, I'd like to hear your response to that question. As much of a Warriors fan as I am and how much I love Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, not so much Draymond, I'll give an honest response, as in I think that the Warriors will have a for sure next year NBA Finals appearance, and then after that I think it might be the decline of their dynasty. I think that teams are really going to put some pressure on them, and I think after all these trades, I mean this year is going to be tough because of how well the chemistry the Golden State Warriors have, and getting all these new acquisitions is going to be tough for that team chemistry to start right away. And those early losses in the season are going to, you know, matter when it comes to, like, your seed in the playoffs. But I think they're going to have one more good season, make it to the NBA Finals. I think the Cavs or Boston Celtics are going to give them a run for the money. And then after that, I think it's going to be a rise of a new team, which I kind of hope so. I mean, I love the Warriors to death, but it kind of gets boring to see them, the same two teams in the finals year after year. It's nothing like a Lakers-Celtics era, which was just an amazing era to be in, but... I'd like to see somebody else kind of roll in. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, I mean, from my perspective, from a Cavs perspective, and even just as a fan of the game of basketball, I don't think the way the Warriors dominated this last year, I don't think that will happen again. I don't think they'll go 16-1 and in this year. Um, and, I mean, I understand you could sit here and play what-ifs, what-ifs all the time. But game 1, Western Conference Finals, San Antonio Spurs have 26, 28 point lead over the Warriors with the current team that they have, and that's without Tony Parker until Kawhi Leonard goes down with his ankle injury. I'm not going to say, and then obviously the Warriors come back, they win, and then they sweep the series. Um, I'm not going to say the Spurs necessarily win that series, 
but it definitely makes it a lot more interesting if Kawhi Leonard is there and is healthy. Um, that, and that's why I think as long as they're healthy, I think right now the Spurs, even with the zero um, changes they've made this summer, I think they can play with the Golden State Warriors. Again, not claiming they're going to beat them, but I think they can play with them. And I think the Cavs and Celtics obviously are making moves to get better. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think at this point... NBA season hasn't even began, training camp, none of that. I think the, at this point the Warriors will probably still win, but I do not think, like when Kyle mentioned, I don't believe that they will dominate the NBA um, like they have this last year. I think they'll still be a top 3-4 team in the league for three to five years. Like I think, I mean, that is definitely longevity. That will be um, quite a while, I think. I mean, even you know, there's talks of Klay Thompson leaving next summer. But, I mean, still, you have Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, and Draymond Green. Like, you still have a phenomenal team there. Um, so I think they'll still be a very good, very dominant team for a long time. But I don't think they will control the NBA and just run the tables like they did this last season at all. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Warriors are obviously a really good franchise right now. Um, when I think about the Warriors, I think of, you know, their big four that they have. And almost in the NBA right now, if you want to compete, if you want to be in the playoffs, you need to have, if you want to be competitive in the playoffs, I should say, you need to have two all-stars on your team. If you want to be, you know, one of the top teams in mostly the Western Conference, but kind of in the Eastern Conference now too, if you want to be at one of the top th- top teams in the East or West, you need to have three all-stars on your team. And if you want to be like sticking out like a sore thumb and you're incredible like the Warriors, you need to have four. And um, that's kind of what they did. Um, but obviously they kind of, you know, that's all they have is they have those four and they have Iguodala. I mean, when I think of that team, I don't really think of any of the other pieces they have on their bench or anything. Um, I think eventually it's going to catch up to them. I think obviously this year, I think they're going to be pretty dominant again this year. I don't think they're going to do the same exact thing they did, obviously, last year, obviously the year before. But I think they're still going to have a really good season. Um, I think the West is just going to be a little bit more competitive for them with the uh, trades and transactions that have kind of gone on. But I still think they're going to end up coming out on top, barring a crazy injury or something like that. But um, like I said, I don't know if they're going to be able to pay those guy- all four of those guys and um, – you know, a decent bench or anything like that, you know, long term. I just think it's kind of hard to keep four all-stars together. I know they're all fairly unselfish guys as far as um, when they play together, but, you know, at the end of the day, it is a business and guys want their money. And um, I think it's going to be interesting how it folds out because they're just a different dynamic um, than other teams that might have four all-stars. I mean, I think if you put really almost any other four all-stars on a team, I think it would be a little bit more beefy and kind of questionable, but these guys are pretty unselfish on and off the basketball court. So I think it's going to be interesting how it unfolds. But, yeah, as of right now, I still think they're going to be a dominant team this next year. Um, But I do think the West is going to be just a hair more competitive um, in the middle to top area um, in the Western Conference. What do you think, Kyle? (laughs) You know, I really think right now it, it's going to depend on, um, like, you're talking about the All-Stars and, you know, having two per team, you know, if you just want to make the playoffs, three if you want to be competitive to, to make um, the finals. Um, I really think that Kevin Durant counts as two All-Stars. You know, if he went to a team that only had one All-Star or two, like, I feel like especially, you know, if he, if he was still playing at OKC, if he went back uh, saying that they didn't have – um, Paul George, I think that they still make a push to beat the Warriors. I, I think he's that good right now. Um, and I know people are going to hate me for saying it, but he's definitely better than LeBron is right now in the NBA. He makes more of an impact. Uh, I love the, love watching the guy play. I think he does more for his team currently. I'm not saying LeBron wasn't that at one point, but I think he, he is the face of the NBA right now. So uh, I believe we're going to cut to a song break and then go ahead and finish up our Season 3, Episode 1 of the Nashy Fries. Yes, sir. Hello, you are listening to WHEI 88.9, broadcasting live from Heidelberg University in Tiffin, Ohio. You're listening to the Nashy Fries show here. We only got uh, about five minutes left, but we just wanted to end on a good note. Um, we talked a lot about 
uh, the NBA and all the trades going on there. But I think it's baseball season. I think we ought to talk a little bit about baseball. So we're going to go around and say who we think will be in the World Series and who's going to win it. Uh, I'm going to put Dom on the spot. I'm going to start him off with it. Um, Dom, give me your predictions for this MLB. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it is September. Uh, Labor Day weekend has passed. Man, come October, it's playoff time, man. It's playoff time. Um, I don't watch a whole lot of baseball until the playoffs. Uh, I watch a decent amount then. Um, World Series, no matter who's in it, I normally watch the World Series every single year. Um, as far as, like, playoffs, who's going to win? Um, I mean, from the AL, obviously the Indians on a 13-game win streak right now. The Indians playing really tough. Indians are playing phenomenal. But yet the Astros, um, still a really good team. Picked up Verlander, Justin Verlander from the Tigers. Um, I mean, yeah, he's not the Cy Young winner that he used to be, but still a phenomenal pitcher um, for the Astros. Um, but then on the NL, obviously you have the Dodgers, 92 wins right now, not too shabby at all. I f- kind of feel bad for the Diamondbacks. Diamondbacks have 81 wins. Like, they're a phenomenal baseball team, and they're still 11 and a half games out of first place in the NL West because they're in the same division as the Dodgers. Um Nationals playing well. Obviously, the Cubs um, on top of the division for now. I think as far as the World Series, <coughs> um, Indians playing phenomenal right now, but I think it's almost a little bit too early. Um, I think the Astros will make it in the AL. I'm, I'm obviously picking the two uh, teams with the best record, so really going out on a curveball on this one. But the Astros with Verlander, I think that's what makes a difference. And again, with the Indians, I mean, baseball, any sport is such a game of momentum. And the Indians have phenomenal momentum right now. Two months is a long time to try to carry that momentum. So I think at some point that momentum will be lost. And I think the Astros in the AL, the Dodgers in the NL, and... I mean, the Dodgers pitching staff is just phenomenal. And obviously, like in any sport, you know, defense wins championships, pitching staffs win championships. Um, I'm going to say the Dodgers in six over the Astros. Who's up for the next prediction? All right, so I got to agree with you. I love the Dodgers. I'm just watching them throughout the season. They're just on a historic run just with the 92 wins and only 46 losses. And, I mean, 162 games can take a wear and it just seems like their players aren't even affected I mean they're almost done with their season and it's almost time for October which is the best time for playoffs and I don't know it's just it's not like it's, it's like they're playing like game 10 out there and in their 163 game season so I definitely think the Dodgers are gonna absolutely dominate the National League run up to the World Series and then the AL gets a little more interesting. I like the I like Cleveland. I like how Corey, Corey Kluber is pitching again this year. He's absolutely phenomenal. And I know Houston has been getting more acquisitions, and I kind of like how Houston hasn't been in this position in a long time, and they're kind of coming up. But at the same time, Boston is also not too shabby. I'd like to see the Red Sox coming back in there. So what I, my prediction is, I think it's going to be the Dodgers and the Boston Red Sox. And I think it's going to go to seven games, but i got to take the how dominant the Dodgers are playing. So I'm going to say Dodgers in seven. Kyle? All right. I mean, I agree with you guys um, with the Dodgers winning it all. I'm going to say in five games, though. Um, you know, and their opponent um, coming from the AL, you know, it's been uh, a real struggle, you know, for the AL to see who's the dominant team. I mean, there's a lot of good teams. There's three great teams out there right now. And I like the move that the Houston Astros made picking up Justin Verlander. A little sad to see him go as a Detroit fan. But I'm going to go against everything I ever believed in here. And, you know, I'm going to go um, with the Indians making it back. Uh, I think that they're on a win streak, like Dom said. Maybe it's a little bit too early. But I think their experience might uh, help them out a little more than the Astros. Um, so I'm going to go with Cleveland and Dodgers. But I believe Dodgers in five. It's going to be a a dominated series, maybe. Uh, Cam Weeks, I'm interested to hear what you got to say about this one. All right, so um, I'm going to go out on a little bit of a limb. I'm going to say that neither of the top seeds are going to make it, just just because, just because. Um, The Dodgers have lost a couple games in a row now, which obviously isn't a huge huge deal, but there are some teams that are kind of making moves up. 
Um, I think the Indians are going to end up prevailing um, as far as the AL goes. Um, obviously, I'm a little biased because um, I like the Indians, but I think Boston's obviously kind of like Steve said too. I think they're going to be kind of interesting. Um, so I think it's going to be you know a tight race up top there, but I like the Indians. And then as far as the NL, I think the Nationals are out of it. I know they have a really good record, but um, just with kind of what's been going on lately, I think they're just going to kind of lose it um, near the end with injuries and things like that that have kind of happened. So I'm actually going to go Diamondbacks. I'm going to go Diamondbacks and Indians, and I'm going to go Indians uh, after that. So uh, we'll see what happens. We'll kind of revisit this. Um in October. October, November shows December. and kind of talk about it. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of the picks for now. Um, it's 10.02, so let's let's wrap it up for the week, guys. All right, well, thank you for tuning in with us, fans. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, yo, man. Thank you so much. Third season, episode one, has been a success so far. As we mentioned at the beginning of the show, yo, major announcements soon come, all right? Major announcements soon come. We up to something. I promise you, everything we do is for the fans, all right? Everything we do is for you. Um, so please uh, just, you know, continue to come along with us through this journey of more success. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So uh, tune in next week. I promise that we're not just going to keep saying big announcement at the end of every episode so you listen to all of them. You'll find out. When you listen next week, all right? That's right. Next week, we will make the announcement. We'll be it's back gonna here. It's going to be crazy. You're going to want to hear it live. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> um, so we'll be back 9 o'clock, WHI 88.9.